This is Bernie Sanders, the self-proclaimed Democratic Socialist Senator from Vermont who is currently the frontrunner to be the Democratic nominee. I, I can't even read this with a straight face. What the hell, Democrats? <laughs> anyway, after a strong performance in Iowa, Bernie Sanders had momentum leading to the New Hampshire primary. Eyeglasses! <laughs> yes, yes they are, Bernie. But during the eighth Democratic presidential debate, George Stephanopoulos asked the candidates on the stage a very important question. Let me just ask, is anyone else on the stage concerned about having a Democratic Socialist at the top of the Democratic ticket? First off, every candidate on that stage should be raising their hand as they are moderate to far-left Democrats, while Bernie Sanders is a radical Democratic Socialist. And as Sanders is their competition, this is the perfect opportunity to try and get in a few punches. But on the other hand, if everyone does raise their hand, it's an instant attack ad for Trump and the GOP. For example, you may remember this moment from the first debate in Miami, Florida. Raise your hand if, gover if your government plan would provide coverage for undocumented immigrants. Okay. Medicare for all is going to be expensive enough without promising to cover undocumented immigrants, so great job, Democrats. As for the Democratic Socialist question in New Hampshire, let's see how that turned out. Let me just ask, is anyone else on the stage concerned about having a Democratic Socialist at the top of the Democratic ticket? I'm not. <laughs> Senator Klobuchar? Now it's an ad for Amy Klobuchar, promoting her as the voice of reason, well, at least in comparison to Bernie. But when the topic turned to healthcare, Klobuchar brought up the elephant in the room. I keep listening to this same debate, and it is not real. It is not real, Bernie, because two-thirds of the Democrats in the Senate are not on your bill, and because it would kick 149 million Americans off their current health insurance in four years. And Klobuchar is right. Sure, you can elect someone because you agree with them on a moral and emotional level, but if your candidate doesn't have the votes in the House and the Senate, you're never going to get anything passed. Bernie's policies include Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, free college for all, canceling all student loan debt, a housing guarantee, federal jobs guarantee, a tax on extreme wealth, and so much more. And if you think that Congress is going to pass any part of Bernie's agenda with the current makeup of the House and the Senate, <laughs> you're f***ing dreaming. I am sensing that the people are ready for a political revolution. And that's the key, a revolution. He needs a Congress full of progressive Democrats like, say, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. As you may know, in 2018, Ocasio-Cortez won her seat from Congressman Joe Crowley, a 10-term corporate Democrat who, at the time, was the fourth most powerful member of the House, and fellow Justice Democrats Ro Khanna of California and Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts also won their House seats after challenging establishment Democratic incumbents but the Democratic establishment are fighting back. In March 2019, it was reported that the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee would blacklist political strategists and vendors that supported candidates attempting to primary incumbent House Democrats. The purpose of the DCCC is to support Democratic House candidates. Its funds are allocated to help Democrats in tough races against Republicans. In January 2020, it was reported that Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez was refusing to pay dues or raise funds for the DCCC. The amount that a sitting congressperson owes to the DCCC is largely based on their leadership role or committee assignments. They are required to pay dues, which largely comes out of campaign funds. Also, each congressperson is given a fundraising goal that they are expected to meet. And as a member of the Financial Services Committee, Ocasio-Cortez owes the DCCC $250,000 in dues and has a fundraising goal of $300,000. Um, you know, I've raised well over $250,000. I've raised $300,000 actually for Democrats across the country, half of which go to swing districts. So I'm playing my part and I'm contributing to our party. So AOC has no problem raising money for fellow Democrats as long as they're progressive Democrats that are fighting the Democratic establishment. In a tweet she added, I also believe that a Dem majority should be transformative, which is why I give strategically. Seems fair, no? No, 
know, it's totally unfair, considering that the rest of the House Democrats at least attempt to pay their dues. At the beginning of this year, DTRIP sent a very, um, a very clear message that they would blacklist any progressive organization that helps candidates like me. It's not that the DCCC is against candidates like AOC per se, but they aren't going to allow political consultants and vendors to help oust sitting Democrats. Take, for example, Cori Bush, who is running for Missouri's first congressional district. But the problem is that Bush is running against Lacey Clay, a Democrat who has held that House seat since 2001. And since Congressman Clay actually pays his dues, who do you think the DCCC is supposed to support? So Ocasio-Cortez is using the blacklist as an excuse not to pay her dues or fundraise for DTRIP. And let's be honest, she likely wasn't going to pay regardless. But if she wants to be a Democrat, she's going to have to play by their rules or face the consequences. Currently, she is on two of the most prestigious panels in the House, the Committee on Financial Services and the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. But if she doesn't pay her dues, Democratic House leadership could make sure that she loses one or both of her committee assignments. And that would be sad, because then we wouldn't get to see moments like this. And this idea of a bootstrap. You know, this idea and this metaphor of a bootstrap started off as a joke because it's a physical impossibility to lift yourself up by a bootstrap by your shoelaces, it's physically impossible. <laughs> if the GOP was really smart, they'd just pay AOC's dues for her because clips like that are just priceless. And then again, if the Republicans end up taking back the House in 2020, AOC will end up having to leave anyway to make room for the incoming majority. Back in January 2019, The Hill reported that at least one House Democrat had floated the idea of recruiting a local politician from the Bronx or Queens as a primary challenger to Ocasio-Cortez in 2020. This is because AOC had thrown her weight behind a national campaign to mount primaries against incumbent Democrats. House Democrats have enough to worry about trying to keep their majority without having to deal with a Democratic Socialist insurgent trying to force the party to the far left. But for those House Democrats, there's some moderately good news. According to Ballotpedia.org, there are no less than five Democrats and eight Republicans attempting to take AOC down. And the highest profile Democratic candidate is former CNBC anchor and contributor Michelle Caruso Cabrera. So get ready for a bunch of AOC versus MCC headlines over the next few months. On the Republican side, you have entrepreneur Shereen Murray and John Cummings, a retired teacher and former NYPD officer. Each has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for their campaigns, largely based on their Fox News appearances. All three of these candidates have argued that AOC is more concerned with her brand and raising her profile, and less concerned about serving her community. And they're exactly right. For example, every single day that AOC is on the road stumping for Bernie Sanders, that's one less day she's spending in her district. Who here is ready for the revolution? Which is ironic because when AOC challenged Congressman Joe Crowley, she ran on the fact that he spent more time in Washington than he did in his house district. And while AOC's challengers definitely have a lot to work with, it remains to be seen whether any of them will be a formidable opponent. And consider that AOC is a fundraising machine who was able to raise $5.3 million in 2019. And with AOC flush with cash, it's going to be a lot harder to beat her in a primary challenge, but that's why Democrats have a plan B. New York's population is dwindling, and the state is expected to lose as many as two congressional districts. And every 10 years, congressional districts are redrawn to reflect census data. So instead of waiting for someone to take her out in a primary challenge, AOC's congressional district could simply be eliminated. For example, this is District 14. The Democrats and Republicans on the redistricting commission could take the current map and agree to redraw it so that AOC's district would be swallowed up by surrounding districts. And if that happens, AOC could then challenge an incumbent Democrat in a nearby district, or even better, challenge Senator Chuck Schumer for his seat in 2022 or Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's seat in 2024. 
Schumer is vulnerable after a failure to impeach President Trump, and Gillibrand is more vulnerable after her failed bid for the Democratic presidential nomination. But in the meantime, I'll be watching events unfold leading to the June primary, so be sure to keep checking back for updates and analysis. And as always, thanks for watching, sharing, and hitting that like button. Follow me at Don't Walk Run on Twitter, and while you're at it, subscribe to the channel. Check out the links in the description and check out these videos that you may have missed. Thanks again for tuning in, and I hope to see you all next time. Fingers crossed that there is next time.